this rotation is just getting started and it's going to continue for years and years and years. The bubble inflated over a period of years. It's going to deflate quicker, but it's still going to play out over an extended period of time. But I think a lot of the gains will be front loaded in that the gains for rotating early will be much greater than the gains to those who rotate late. Meaning the sooner you can read the writing on the wall and react, I think the greater the profit. Now, some people are going to be like deer in a headlight. They've been following this momentum strategy for so long and they've fallen in love with their stocks. It's going to be a while before they sell them. They're not going to be able to recognize what's changed. You know, they have this buy the dip mentality and they think, well, if we just hold and hope, uh, it's going to come back. Well, it's not going to come back and it's going to take a long time for some people to recognize that and throw in the towel. But the people who recognize it early and make the shift will be in a much better position. Of course, I made the shift a long time ago. I had no idea a decade ago that it would take this long for this rotation to begin. I thought that the markets would have wised up sooner and started moving out of U.S. stocks, out of the dollar, in the foreign stocks, in the value stocks earlier. Well, they didn't do it earlier. They're doing it now. They have a lot of catching up to do because during the interim, U.S. stocks got even more overpriced on a relative basis than the rest of the world. And more importantly, the problems in the U.S. economy got even bigger, especially this inflation problem that the Fed is powerless to do anything about. Powell is acting as if the Fed is somehow trapped in this low interest rate environment. The Fed created the low interest rate environment. That's why it exists. The Fed brought interest rates down to zero. That's why they're so low. One of the reasons that I was so critical of taking interest rates from 5% to zero is because I said, how are you going to get them back up again? I said, it's one thing to slash them to zero. It's another thing to raise them back up again. Because by lowering interest rates to zero, you encourage all sorts of debt. And now when everybody is loaded up with debt, how do you pull the rug out from under them? How do you normalize interest rates when you have an abnormal amount of debt? So we're not just stuck in this low interest rate environment. The Fed trapped everybody in this low interest rate environment. And now the Fed is claiming, it's like, well, because we're in this low interest rate environment, well, you know, we have no excuse but to use QE. They do have an excuse because they're the reason that interest rates are at zero. Raise interest rates. Why don't you, you know, don't complain that rates are at zero when you've got them stuck at zero. Look at the Fed's balance sheet. Where would interest rates be if the Fed's balance sheet wasn't so big? Obviously, the Fed is holding them down. And of course, the Fed is going to point to interest rates all around the world and say, well, they're low in Europe, they're low in Asia. Of course, we've got the reserve currency. We're basically setting monetary policy for the rest of the world. If we had normal interest rates, if interest rates were 4 or 5% in the United States, you think they'd be zero in Europe? Of course not. We are the ones that are setting this precedent People are taking their cue from the Federal Reserve. Now, of course, they're going to break from the Fed because they're going to have to respond to this inflation problem, which is now global. It's not just a U.S. problem. It's happening all over the world. The difference is the rest of the world may be in a position to do something about their inflation. We're in no position to do something about ours because of the enormity of the debt that we have. The system is not working. I mean, it's, it's working for the government, but it's not working for the economy. It's not working for the people. Uh, and that's the problem that Austrian economists understand. And just, you know, kind of to give you a cliff notes of, you know, what Austrian school is versus other schools of economic thought, you know, Keynesianism being, you know, probably the most popular right now. Austrians put the emphasis for economic growth on savings and production. Uh, not uh, spending and consumption. And so they look at all fiscal and monetary policy that is trying to stimulate demand as being misguided and actually counterproductive because they put the cart before the horse. Now, a lot of that stimulus comes in the form of money. Hey, let's just print up money so that people can spend it and that's going to grow the economy. But the Austrians don't see any value added by just printing fiat currency. Because when you print money, 
you don't increase the supply of goods and services to buy with that money. So all that really you have is inflation. You just have more money chasing whatever supply of goods and services exists. And so prices go up. What money really is, is a way to facilitate trade. It is an improvement on barter. See, before money was invented, you know, if you were a chair maker and you wanted a pair of shoes, you had to find a guy that made shoes that you liked who also wanted your chairs. So it was a very inefficient way to transact business. But when somebody realized, hey, wait a minute, you know, gold is a very good commodity that we can trade in because it's easily divisible, it's portable, its value is stored, all gold is the same. You don't have to worry about your chair being different or your shoes being different. Every ounce of gold is exactly the same. And even if you yourself don't need the gold because you're not a jeweler, uh, you know, you're not making anything with gold, somebody will. And of course, gold was a luxury good. Most people like to have things made out of gold, whether it was jewelry or other ways they were adorning, uh, you know, their, their houses with it or, you know, whatever they had. I mean, gold was inlaid in a lot of goods. And so everybody would want gold, whether you needed it or not. So using money as opposed to barter uh, was a big improvement. And of course, since Austrians look at economic growth as a function of capital investment, which is only financed out of savings, you want to have money that you can save and it will store its value. So when you're using gold as money, it's an ideal mechanism for saving. And so if you have more savings in an economy, you have more capital investment and then you have more economic growth. Uh, there's an old saying, or I don't know if it's an old saying, I think it was Thomas Jefferson, maybe I'm wrong, but the government that governs best governs least. And that's pretty much the success of Singapore or any country uh, that has limited government is the less involvement the government has in the economy, the more prosperity the economy enjoys. So that is the secret of places like Singapore or like Hong Kong in that government uh, was small. And that was also the reason that the U.S. prospered during the 19th century. And in fact, and this is a point where I take exception, I think that, you know, you can't even argue, but I think the the most prosperous period in U.S. history, right, where living standards for the average American rose the most was probably the period between the end of the Civil War and, let's say, the beginning of the First World War, you know, around that time period. And, and, and during that time period, you had phenomenal economic growth, right? You had the whole transformation of the U.S. economy through the Industrial Revolution from a largely farm-based economy to a manufacturing economy. You had the invention of all sorts of goods that previously never even existed. And so people's lives really got transformed in their living standards. And that was also the purest gold standard up until the beginning of the Federal Reserve. That was the purest gold standard the U.S. ever enjoyed. And that was the most prosperous period in U.S. history. And so having gold as money was not an impediment to economic growth. In fact, it helped foster economic growth. And despite all that rapid economic growth, and also at the same time, America was absorbing millions and millions of immigrants, including all four of my grandparents who came to America during that period from Eastern Europe. Lots of people were coming here and the gold standard worked beautifully. More people coming, more goods and services being produced, and consumer prices declined during that period. With all that economic growth, we didn't see consumer prices going up. We saw consumer prices going down. We saw the value of savings going up. So I don't see how you can say that it would be a step backwards to return to a monetary system that enjoyed so much success. I mean, compared to what we have now, I mean, the complete collapse and we have the, we go from boom the bust to boom the bust, but we, we, we basically hollowed out the entire U.S. economy. Under this fiat system, we've gone from the world's biggest creditor to the world's biggest debtor. I mean, the standard of living of average Americans has been destroyed by government. I mean, now a middle class family, you have two people barely making a living, whereas prior to that, you know, one person could have a job and support an entire family and have savings. So I, I think that we it's not it's not a step backwards. It's progress to go back to what used to work rather than continue uh, what's failed. The thing is, why did America succeed so much more than the rest of the world? And it was because we succeeded in limiting government. We had more economic freedom in the United States. And that's why people came here. It was to escape bigger governments in their own countries to enjoy the freedom and the prosperity that went along with it here in the United States. It was it was a combination of limited government. I mean, if you have big government, it doesn't matter how much land you have. You need freedom. Freedom is the key ingredient. And that's what people wanted. And that was a source of our 
our prosperity. You know, we didn't have taxes back then. We didn't have income taxes. We didn't have Social Security taxes. We didn't have a Federal Reserve. We didn't have minimum wage. We didn't have any of the labor laws. We had a free economy. And that's what produced our prosperity, not the fact that we had land. There was land all over the world. But it's kind of ironic that you have people like AOC and the left complaining about the problems that they themselves created. I mean, college tuition would not be so expensive, but for government uh, aid to uh, education, both subsidized, guaranteed student loans and direct student loans, that's why the prices have gone up. The same thing with health care. I mean, the free market would bring health care costs down. It's government involvement that is the reason health care is so expensive. But, you know, the biggest problem with the U.S. economy is all of the malinvestment, which is a Keynesian term, uh, but it's the result of the artificial suppression of interest rates that has you know, screwed up our capital structure to the point where the U.S. is not really manufacturing because we don't have the savings and investment to sustain that. Of course, we have excess regulation uh, that helps make our manufacturing less competitive. But these artificial interest rates and government spending have created a bubble economy that is based on uh, consumption and spending. But in order to run a consumption-based economy, somebody has to produce all the goods that we're consuming, and that is falling largely on the rest of the world, a lot of the emerging market economies like China. So we run these enormous trade deficits so that we can consume things that we did not produce, and everybody has these service sector jobs, and we have this enormous government, and it's this giant bubble economy that's sustained by the artificial suppression of interest rates, which continues to exacerbate these underlying economic imbalances that ultimately are going to need to be corrected with a major economic collapse. You know, part of the Austrian school is understanding that a lot of these economic booms are the problem. They are created by government. When they bust, that is the free market trying to fix the problems that were created during the artificial booms. But then the government steps up and tries to mitigate the recessions, even though the recession is the cure that we need, but we never really cure the problems because we get government intervention to try to make the problems worse. And we've been doing that for so long that the problems are now so big that I think the next downturn from a monetary perspective could be a fatal one. And uh, we end up with a hyperinflation situation, uh, which will be catastrophic. Before we continue, help us clicking that YouTube like button and subscribe now to our channel. This shows the algorithm that you valued this information. And it helps us spread that message. Sharing is caring. And now, let's continue. Do you want to know one thing about crypto? I made over 3000% in profit in a few weeks. Fact is, the traditional financial system, the traditional money system makes you poor, not rich. If you want to earn $500,000, $1 million, you have to wait until you're 50, 60, 70 in the traditional financial system and you probably will still be broke and you will be old. This is not a sexy combination as you can imagine. But the question is, how can you start in crypto and make these profits? Where to invest? Where to start? My name is Gunnar and I'm from Germany as you can hear and things are a little bit different in Germany. More about that later on. The fact is, there are lots of different cryptocurrencies. It's a gigantic universe where beginners and professionals get easily lost. But there is light at the end of the tunnel. There are seven key steps you need to follow to become successful in this market. You have to know them and if you fail one of them, it's literally impossible to succeed in this market. Just an example, one of the key points is your exchange and one of the biggest are for example Binance and Coinbase. These are trusted and well established exchanges but, and this is a big but, you won't find the super profitable coins on those exchanges. The unknown super profitable coins that get gigantic profits are not traded on those kind of exchanges. They are traded on much smaller insider platforms that are barely known. And I can tell you what those super secret exchanges are and why they are so profitable. And another super important thing are the right information sources. The point is, the internet is gigantic. There are hundreds and hundreds of YouTube channels, blogs, pages and much, much more. And there are also market makers and influencers. For example, Elon Musk, he is not a crypto guy. But the moment he recommended Dogecoin, it went through the roof, to the moon so to say. But why did he recommend it? Where did he hear it from? He didn't hear it from newspapers. And believe me, he is listening to someone. But you have to know who and you have to react before he is reacting. 
This is really, really important. And these are only two of the seven steps you have to follow in order to be successful in crypto. And if you want to know all of these steps in much more detail, and if you want to have a comprehensive checklist, here's what you should do. There is a link below this video. Click on this link and you will get the opportunity to subscribe to my channel. Click on the link and you will see a video where I explain the next steps. So see you soon. Click on the link now. I'll see you there.